All right. Good evening, Dr. Professor Ronald Holmes. Thank you very much, uh, Ronald, for joining us. Good evening, Richard. Good evening. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> My apologies again. Things uh, started a little bit later than uh, than expected. As you know, with all the developments uh, in the Middle East, uh, we have to also keep abreast with that. Now, <laughs> let's be honest, right? There's so much to discuss uh Dr. Holmes, I mean, first of all, of course, we're, you know, just to be clear, we were colleagues back in the day in La Salle. We have been friends for quite some time. So I can say with a lot of confidence that I'm familiar with you, with your works, of course, you know, you know, your integrity, you as being one of the leading political scientists in the country. I think people forget that you're 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 not just a Pulse Asia chief, but you're also one of the leading political scientists who has written fantastic stuff on populism and politics in the Philippines. So I hope today, you know, I can force not force you, but You'll be wearing two hats, right? Both as a political analyst and also as as the guy who's you know in charge of Pulse Asia. So before we go to the, siguro mas mainit na issues that I know you know you, you see them coming. Uh, let's just talk about you. So uh, so Professor Holmes, how did you end up in Pulse Asia? What is the backstory here? I mean, uh, I was very you know back in the day when I was a student in UP. Of course, one of the professors I was very used to was I mean was very close to uh, was Pepe Miranda, right? Uh, and in fact, you get the right to call him Pepe Dao if you top his class, which, you know, something that we have to be, you know, afforded to do at some point. So, like, so Pepe Miranda is someone who's, who's very familiar to me from my undergraduate days. And uh, so there's a backstory to that. Uh, what I wanted to understand is how did you end up in Pulse Asia? And uh, tell us a little bit about that. What's Pulse Asia? What's its history? How did you end up in Pulse Asia? And, and, and the chief of Pulse Asia, for that matter. When... Uh, first, Richard, you can just call me Loni, like Pepe. Um, I after I was with Pulse from the beginning as a group, part of a group of academics that was 1999. The main reason for that is that I worked with Pepe in one social weather stations project earlier. I think that was in 1997. But prior to that, I was doing surveys uh, largely to La Salle, the Social Development Research Center. So in this sense, I've been doing surveys since uh, 1994. No, uh, so it's been, it's been quite some time. I from 1999, the date when the year when Pulse was founded, I was on and off, no, because I was doing school administration, and when I resigned from school administration in 2008, prior to the resignation, actually. Uh, I was approached to take on the presidency of Pulse. So I decided then that I'll take it on, no? 2008. So from that date, from that year, I've been president of Pulse and it's been quite a challenging work. Um, so that was also the time, I think two years before that, Pepe had already more or less uh, semi-retired from Pulse. He was still doing work, but he had given up the presidency. Let me ask you, were you a kind of a stat person? Were you a numbers person? Because usually the joke with political scientists, this is a guy who didn't like numbers and therefore who went there. But what was this backstory to you? I mean, were you fascinated by by the science of survey and, and, and public opinion uh, measurement? I'm, I'm not a stats person. We do have a statistician. The uh, statistician in our case is Dr. Ana Tabunda, used to be the dean of the School of Statistics at UP. I do understand statistics. I'm more of a quality uh, researcher. My research has really been more qualitative. Although I like looking at numbers, but I'm not the, to the extent that quite positive is, no? that I'd like to explain certain things working with, um, let's say, looking at correlations and looking at regressions. I do understand it, but I think the context is quite important. Um, so in the in this case, I'm literate, but not necessarily an expert in terms of statistics. I would leave that to the statistician. I mean, the reason I ask is because, you know, speaking of Pepe Miranda and also my colleague in Philippine Daily Inquirer, uh, Dr. Mangas, no, I mean, these were people who were part of the whole Chicago University Behaviorist Revolution. I think thanks to Pepe, uh mga Paul say students, we were forced to take calculus, right? Among others. So hindi lang, you know, basic algebra and all, even calculus, of course, given name statistics. So so that's that's the context because we know that in our field in political science, you know, there are some people who are hardcore quantitative, right, and moving that direction, including folks 
where you where you got your PhD, of course, at the Australian National University. So I just wanted to clarify that because for some reason we, we've been friends and colleagues for quite some time, but I never got a chance to, to ask you how much of a stat geeky guy you are. But essentially, <laughs> what you're saying is that you're you're literate, so you, you know you, you're not totally clueless about this, obviously. But you have mm -hmm. really stat experts there in Pulse Asia to take care yeah. of that business. Yeah, yeah, and and then we I I do get to process some data. But I normally use an application rather than do the programming. Uh, the statisticians do the programming. I'm not yet into programming, neither R nor Stata. I, I basically work with SPSS in terms of the statistical processing. So uh, I, I don't know the syntax. I know what uh, uh, application, what process needs to be done. But that's about it. Uh, I, I will not go into the actual computation per se but of course something that i notice in your works is you're very evidence-based numbers based in terms of your qualitative analysis right like you're not make gonna make opinion about uh, you're gonna not gonna make an analysis about let's say populism in the philippines you know just out of nowhere you look at also the numbers and what pop public opinion does those are the things that i see in, in your literature you know i'm just saying this for folks who are yeah. trying to understand uh, you know, where you're coming from. Now, can we slightly also talk about Pulse Asia? So what are the origins of Pulse Asia? Because I think this is also something very important because we have SWS and then we have Pulse Asia. Essentially, these have been the two pillars of scientific, credible, uh, nonpartisan uh, public opinion measurement in the Philippines for quite some time. Can you give us a little bit of history of that also, uh, uh, Ronnie? Yeah, yeah I think... Well, it was in 1999 that Pepe established it. Uh, there were there was a group of academics together with Pepe. Uh, we were part of that group. Um, there were about, I think, 10 of us. But in the board, there were about five people. Uh, that included Pepe, Mercy Abad, who's also a market research uh, guru. Um, so 1999, that was the time that Pepe also left the social weather station. So, uh, Pepe and Mahar are founding fellows of the social weather stations. So it became the second, um, um, well, not exactly second, but one of the few major research organizations uh, because you have lo long standing organizations such as the Philippines Survey Research Center, aside from the social weather stations. So there are a number of market research groups, but Pulse and SWS are the ones that are known to conduct the regular quarterly assessments of the national administration, uh, as well as political issues. Now, before we go to the more, perhaps my init or contentious part of our discussion and conversation for that matter, um, in general, how important is this development? I mean, Kumpara dun sa mga panon na walang scientific surveys, ano yung ambag ng scientific surveys? You know, I, I know that, you know, Pepe Miranda, of course, had a very important chapter about public opinion and democracies and measurement of that. You know, how important is having scientific surveys to healthy democracy for that matter? Yeah. You do get the sense. That's why I think this is one of the reasons why Pepe, for example, labeled the quarterly surveys ulat ng bayan. Because what we often hear as opinion that is normally circulated, disseminated, will be the opinion of a few. You do have the elite, then you have intellectuals, you have commentators. Uh, but we rarely are able to surface the opinion of the public, regardless of whether this opinion, from the perspective of some people, would be baseless or not. But we need to surface the opinion of the public. Uh, and that's that's the important thing about systematic surveys, no? You're trying to get a gauge of the public's pulse at a particular point in time, and you do it systematically. It may not necessarily be uh, from the perspective of critics, an informed opinion, but nonetheless, it's, it's an opinion that we need to work with, whether you're in government or outside government. Sometimes you have to think, Richard, no? why is it that people hold this opinion? Why is it that people tend to go towards a direction that you think is inappropriate? But you have to accept that that is what they believe in. Now, the challenge for both government and let's say for educators like us is to find ways in terms of trying to change that opinion to something that we think will be more favorable. Favorable in the sense that it will address a problem or it will lead towards, in, in my case, my passion is towards leading towards more political engagement. Uh, 
on the part of the public. But that's something that we do gather in a systematic fashion. So it's really a challenge in terms of getting the public's opinion relative to the opinion of the few. You do not necessarily, these are not opposed to each other, but having the elite opinion and the public opinion side by side will let us understand that there are differences and that we need to be able to uh, calibrate what our actions are as it relates to, let's say, the prevailing public opinion. Thank you for that, uh, Ronnie. I mean, going back to this, when it comes to... So essentially what you're saying here is nagkaroon ng boses ang taong bayan. Like, there were all already these opinions, but for a long time, we were really relying on the narrow elite to tell us ano yung inisip ng mga tao, di ba? So thanks to scientific surveys, uh, you're giving voice to the people. In fact, so much so that their voice becomes part of the conversation and in, 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 in our own experience as political analysts, a lot of times our own voice is shaped by this voice, right? So it completely changes the dynamics. So in that sense, it contributes a deepening and pluralistic nature for democracy. I think that's a very important point to mention here. Now, um, just in terms of the operational aspect, uh, so like, uh, because our understanding is like survey agency, like you is a politico, gusto malaman kung may chance ka manalo sa Senate or President or something like that, pupunta ka. And of course, this is not for free. You have to, you know, give a certain fee, etc. So uh, how do we go from that to the ones that are freely shared with us, uh, you know, other academics, uh, people in the media? Di ba dapat ang mga surveys are, you know, essentially commissioned? Um, so what is the difference between commissioned uh, surveys and the ones that you release? I mean, or when did this start? Now you're you're releasing your data for, for public consumption, considering how expensive and difficult it is to come up with this nationwide scientific uh, surveys. Well, it's part of the mission of Pulse to do the quarterly surveys. These are non-commissioned surveys. Uh, the survey questions are essentially framed by Pulse. We do have a set of regular questions that we ask every quarter. You have the assessment of the national administration, the major concerns that people feel the administration should address, among others. So um, regardless of whether there are subscribers or not, we conduct those surveys on a quarterly basis. Um, the difference between that and the commission survey is that the commission survey is financed by someone else. It's not financed by Pulse. Um, but it doesn't mean that the commission survey would come up with results that are favorable to the commissioning entity. It's essentially, Richard, it's the same thing that we do in research. You know, when an external agency taps us to do research, we conduct the research adhering to the norms of social science research, and we report out the findings regardless of whether these are favorable or unfavorable to the commissioning entity. That's the same with regard to commission surveys. If it turns out that the results of the survey are unfavorable to the commissioning entity, we'll just tell them the, those results. There's no way that we will agree to fudge the data or alter the data so that it will suit their interests because that, to us, will also not be serving the interests of the commissioning entity. It's basically, basically falsifying data for the sake of really pleasing them, which will not necessarily be good also for their interests because if they're lagging behind in the pre-election contest, and you give them a result that shows that they're not, then what would that do to their own strategy? You know, that's just basically fooling them. Yeah. So I think people should be disabused from the belief that commission surveys are surveys that would tend to favor the commissioning entity. No, that is not the case. Not at least for reputable organizations that we know of, including Pulse. Um, it's just that there's a different funder for that matter, and it's not internally funded uh yeah i mean exactly i mean if, if you come up with mumbo jumbo results and then set actual elections hopeless yung lumabas then you know then, then then you have no credibility why should i come to you if you're just gonna feed me delusions right but that brings us to another issue uh, uh ronnie no uh the issue of yung argument na surveys shape opinion or my mind conditioning aspect to that. You have also written uh, academic works on that. I've also looked at the literature throughout the years. What is your take? Because I think your take is quite nuanced on that. No, I mean, obviously, in, you know, look at a lot of our presidents that were not the expected presidents or even if they were the expected presidents in elections, the margins sometimes were not expected. So 
Um, I, I'm not sure about the mind conditioning argument, but for the sake of discussion, anong, um, anong take mo dyan sa mind conditioning argument? That the surveys are just a propaganda to shape. So essentially self-fulfilling prophecy sila. That's the kind of counter argument we usually hear. Well, it's pretty difficult to say it's mind conditioning because there are basically, and we've seen this in our pre-election surveys, you've seen shifts in terms of preferences no, from one survey to another. And the studies that have been done in other countries will point towards two types of uh, effects of surveys. One is the bandwagon. There's a tendency, supposedly, for people to follow the survey results and vote according to the survey results. Whoever is leading will be supported. The other one is the underdog effect, which is the opposite. No, If you're really passionate about a candidate and that candidate is lagging behind on the survey, then you will mobilize more support for that candidate. So th those two, even just by those two, they tend to nullify one another, you know, equalizing effect between bandwagon and the um, underdog. But what we have established in our own studies is that surveys have very little influence on voting behavior. It's self-serving. That's why we do not necessarily publicize it. Because when we ask people what, the, what sort of information influences your voting behavior, and we include survey results as one of those, there are about 11, there's a tendency for the survey results to be at the bottom of the list. Uh, they will say that news about the candidate is important. Uh, information coming from family members is important. So surveys are not as consequential in terms of influencing voting behavior. So that's the reason why we say it does not necessarily condition at least voting decisions. Um, now, it does, and I think it's good for other social scientists to do the studies in terms of whether it does condition uh, because we, we do our own. But it will be really, and that's why I always encourage social scientists to do the independent study. We provide them the data. We provide them opportunities to even ride on to our surveys, uh, at least the reputable ones. And if they find come up with different findings, then it is up to them to publicize it. Um, and those are based largely on data that we gather or data that we provide to them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, after all, I mean, people forget these are snapshots, right? These are snapshots of what's the situation when the surveys was conducted, and it's not deterministic in a sense that malalaman mo exactly what will happen in the week. I mean, we saw the huge movements up and down, and uh, you're saying obviously there's a dialectical process. I mean, kung leading as a survey early on, ikaw pa yung target ng iba, di ba? And then, yeah, yeah. and then you can adjust your. Obviously, I mean. If you want to help your client in commission surveys, maybe realistically you could tell that person I think strength and weakness is more, but you cannot doctor the numbers or you you cannot expect to tell them we can condition the mind of people because there are other survey agencies who can provide more accurate one. And the next time, oh, wala na kain cliente, right? I mean, we're just trying to uh, play devil's advocate here because uh, Ronnie, to be honest, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding out there now. One of the other big misunderstandings, I think this is where we have to go to the science part of this. What is a scientific survey when it comes to gauging public opinion? Because obviously, this is not census. I keep on hearing, sa buong buhay ko, hindi pa ako na-interview ng boss Asia or SWS. Therefore, hindi ko alam sinong kausap nila. Let's explain to them that this is not a census, right? I mean, even with census, sometimes you can get skipped. Can we explain to them what is the representative sample? What is the, you know, how do we make sure that uh, I mean, like, you know, what's the dirty kitchen process that goes into measuring, you know, opinion of the whole nation based on a representative sample? Well, just remember, Richard, we have a popula adult population of, what, close to 70 million right now. And normally in a survey, we get, what, 1,200, 2,400. So the chance of one getting interviewed is quite minimal. Actually, well, one less of than our... winning bingo, no? I mean, bingo. I think twenty-five uh, million or something yeah. like that. <laughs> less than less than winning the lotto. Exactly, must my chance ka manalo ng lotto. As one of my colleagues wrote in one article that appeared in a network, it's easier to get to find a soulmate than be a respondent in survey. My uh, hugot pa. <laughs> so, mas madali ka pa makahanap ng BFF o forever mo okay sa mas survey ka. Uh, the main reason is that, you know, it's basically, in, in our case, for example, the multi-stage sampling, what we do is that we first divide the sample that we decided on in the sub-national area. So if we have 1,200, 
we decide whether we will distribute this equally into the four areas, 300 each, which we normally do. And then in each of those areas in the national capital region, we cover all of the cities and municipality here. But that means basically getting 300 in the entire NCR. And if you have a population of, let's say, more than a million in Quezon City, uh, we draw about, what, 60 in Quezon City, 40, 45 to 60. So that means that um, that's a chance of people in Quezon City. So it's a very minimal chance. In the balance of Luzon, then you're covering a larger area here. We draw randomly the city municipality. And then from that city, we draw the barangay. And then from that barangay, we randomly identify the starting point. And in the household, we randomly select the respondent. Uh, so it's pretty rare for someone to be selected. As long as you do the random selection, which is essentially the probabilistic the explanation here is that everyone has a chance to be selected as part of the sample. Uh, so as long as you do that, then you can say that it's representative within a given margin of error. No? Um, I remember my neighbor was selected. Uh, and I live in Bacoor. My neighbor was selected and immediately after being selected, she talked to my mom and said, I think yeah, Pulse Asia just interviewed me. Uh, uh, because I myself have not been interviewed uh, by that was, interview, close, that was close survey, survey organization and I do have problems with census census no? but that's that's the thing here we, it you need to do it probabilistically um, as the statisticians explain it it's like essentially, um, tasting your food, no, you mix it properly and then you get it from the bottom rather than eat the entire dish. Because if you eat the entire dish, you don't have anything else to eat. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I had my own version of uh, I don't know, either uh, parang version of pizza or something like that, you know, like you don't need to eat the whole pepperoni to know whether it tastes good, you just get the parts that has the cheese, the pepperoni, and the bread, right. Just that yeah. it's like being a food critic, you know. I was like, if you're from Michelin, right? You want to start. You don't have to eat the whole thing. The food critics just look at the parts. You get tiny parts of everything you put it together, and you have an idea how it works. I think when we explain it that way, you must not get Santao how representative sample works. Now that's conceptual, uh, Ronnie. I'll push you a little bit. I remember when I was doing stat back in the day, undergraduate. We did uh, surveys um, in Payatas, if I'm not mistaken. And I remember something like. Back in, and actually, in survey naman about potential mayors and council, it, it turned out correct. This is long time ago, obviously. So I, I was very impressed with what we did as students. No, um, from my major fainting memory, but from what I remember, it's like young teacher naman back in the day said something like, um, parang what like when you go there, like parang randomly pick someone. Like I mean, like, like there's a there, there's a process there. Like, can you explain to us, like? When you walk into a barangay, how do you choose which house to go to? Like, uh, you know, at yeah. ground level. So I think we explain scientifically how it works. It's like you don't need to eat the whole pizza to know the masala. You can get the slice that has all the ingredients that gives you an idea, right? Proportional to actual, you know, full uh, combination. Now, but on the ground, let's go dirty kitchen, the one. How is how is it done? Like when you send your folks to do service, how is it done? Can we explain? Because Feeling ko, ano, ah, Ronnie, marami kasing mystification here. Eh, no? So let's demystify it para the mumbo-jumbo speculations go away. Yeah, so, for example, the barangay, when we select the, select the barangay, we basically identify a random starting point. That random starting point might be, let's say, the church. Uh, there are certain barangays, especially in the urban areas where you have a map of the barangay. Right? So we can say, for example, in this barangay, we start from the church. And from that church, you count, let's say, in an urban area, every five households. So the sixth household is the household where you select a random respondent. So uh, in some barangays, of course, that fifth household may actually be in the third story of a building. Right, Richard? In in Metro Manila, for example, mahirap ka makakita ng in, sa informal settlements na meron ka mga structure na limang palapag, pero ang household dyan, maaring sampu. So... That, that's what we mean by household. It's not the structure per se. It's the household. And in that household, basically from that starting point, you follow the uh, interval. And then you start off with the, from the sixth household. 
And then after the six household, you follow again, five, you enter the next one and you try to select a respondent. In that household, the respondent to be selected is either male or female, depending on the last number of the questionnaire. So if the questionnaire is odd, the last number is odd, then it's male. If the last number is even, then it's female. Then there's a kish grid, there's a table where you list down the members of the household. And then that kish grid basically identifies who should be the respondent, how, how random should be the selection of the respondent. So if it's even, the ending is even, only the female members of the household, you will only select randomly from the female members of the household who are adults. Uh, because we normally interview adult respondents only. Uh, so that's how random it is. Um, in rural areas, the interval is about two households. Because in rural areas, you know, Richard, it might be there's one household here and the next household will be a kilometer away. So in, in that case, the interval is uh, smaller than the interval that we follow in in urban households. So you adjust it to the topography and essentially the how yep. residential, residential areas and, and you know, people essentially are distributed. And again, just for an idea of, for instance, you know, there are certain areas that may just suddenly unstable or there's like war, etc. How do you make sure that... Uh, that doesn't affect the representative sample sampling process, for instance. There, then, then you do a substitution of the of the barangay per se, and the substitute barangay should basically have the same characteristic as the initial barangay that was randomly selected. So, comparative so, sample. Comparative, for example, we go to an area that we know is uh, conflict uh, affected. Uh, without knowing that there are barangays that are conflict affected, we selected one barangay. Or it might just be simply a barangay that was affected by a calamity. Well, Richard, it's not a question of conflict. Uh, you know, there are occasions where in we yeah, have lying, our service, right? Hold Visayas yeah. area. Yeah, we have our service close to at, at, about a week after a typhoon hit a particular area, but that area could not in any way be accessed. So what happens is that there's always that random selection of a substitute barangay. Uh, we cannot exclude barangays immediately just because we think that they cannot be accessed. The only barangays that we normally are uh, able to exclude are the barangays that are impenetrable because they're exclusive. Uh, and that's the reason why we don't get so much of the A and B class. No? The real A. Is it Das Marinias? Das Marinias or those high-class condominium units where you cannot really enter. And if you do enter, it might be really a you would be basically be picked up by the security. So those are barangays. When we select, we know that it's basically impossible for us. In those barangays, in 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 those areas, basically the survey method that you use is not anymore the method that we normally use, which is probabilistic. You can do more purposive sampling there, like snowball or chain referral. But that won't be as representative. I mean, that won't be easy to generalize. It may be representative only for that survey, but you cannot say that this is true for all of those who belong to that class because it's not done probabilistically. Uh, now, before we go to the digital surveys, because I'm sure that's a topic we'll be interested to talk about, let's stick to this because, um, you know, a few years ago, there were reports that not your survey agency, but apparently not a survey agency. Though there was a situation whereby you mga uh you mga tao na in charge of doing the surveys apparently were just filling it up themselves. You know, like some mumbo jumbo was happening. They don't know what they or they were not able to do it properly on the ground. How do you guard against uh those kinds of situations? How do you how do you guard the guardians, right? Or how do you make sure that the folks that you send out there to do the surveys are really going to the right person? What kind of safeguard mechanisms are there? Well, man, um, a certain number of surveys are supervised. That means we have people who are actually going with the interviewers, the enumerators in those surveys. There are people that have um, higher responsibility securing that the interviewers are actually doing their jobs. The other one is what we call spot check. Uh, a proportion of surveys that are completed are checked again by randomly by our field supervisors. That means they go back to the place where a survey was conducted. They verified that the survey was done. They asked questions that were similar to the questions that were asked. So in that case, you find out whether the survey was actually done. 
at the end of each day, another way to check it, at the end of each day, you do have a meeting between the interviewers and the field supervisor when they try to look at the completed surveys. And if there are errors or there are deficiencies that are found, the surveys are repeated. Uh, I think this was one of the things that was um, misreported at one point. No, it was not ours. Uh, it no, it's not, it's not with Pulse Asia. I mean, but, but, but it was with another agency. But it's, it was not necessarily a process that was bad because normally at the end of the day, the interviewers and the field supervisors gather in one place and then they check the completed questionnaires. They do not add to what was uh, answered, but they simply check it because if a number of the questions are not answered, you need to repeat that interview. Uh, so that's what you call field editing. And it's done at the end of the day just to check whether the the survey was done appropriately. Because if, if so many questions are not answered, that means that that particular interview oh is quite deficient, right? So... Uh, then you will have to really do another interview uh, or discard that one if need be. But if you do have the time, then you do and follow the protocol in terms of substituting for an in and an, uh, substitute it with another interview. Well, the next question when it comes to the safeguards and, you know, house cleaning and all of those things. The other question is, and I think this is where you and I have see self aware. Ho. You and I had back in the years, you know, some sort of slight disagreement perhaps on this, but, I mean, the argument is how do you make sure that uh, people uh, are fully comfortable with sharing their honest opinion, uh, especially in certain areas where you have, I mean, essentially warlords are the congressman or warlords are the barangay chairman or where you had, as in recent cases, like high incidence of EJK. I mean, you can imagine people have trust issues with anyone asking them about their real opinion and perhaps people would try to err on the side of caution. Um Obviously, I talked about fear factor in the past, but that's my take, and and you have your your different take. Um, what are the safeguards against us? How do you make sure that fe people feel comfortable enough to share their honest opinion in some extreme circumstances? Obviously, Iranian it, that's not the case everywhere and all the time, but you know here and there there could be some you know uh, uh some distortionary effect because of the extraordinary circumstances. What are your ways of dealing with mitigating the, those kinds of circumstances? Well, one is that we do not force anyone to uh, be a respondent. Um, so they're allowed to refuse uh, um, any interview. So we do track our refusal rates. So the refusal rates have remained the same. So when you say, let's say in an area where people are apprehensive that they might be surveyed uh, uh, and there are people who are looking behind their shoulders, behind them, then you do get you do expect that people will refuse but our refusal rates have not changed um before we conduct the survey we read to them the consent form we tell them what the survey is all about we tell them that they have the right to uh, not answer any of the questions at any point if they wish to withdraw from the survey then they can do so uh so in this sense we we allow them to just simply refuse answering any question if they feel that they were intimidated, my number is there also, and the number of our research director, they can call us at any time. No? Um, so basically what we do is that we assure them that the survey is done for a particular purpose in that consent form. And before the survey starts, we get their oral consent. Um, now... Um, for we that, also the oral it, consent, Aroni, not a record bayan or like, you know, well, it, uh, yeah, it's basically binabasa and then uh, the interviewer uh, basically notes that the person agreed to be interviewed. In certain cases, some of them would ask uh, that that one would be signed. No? Uh, but it's a consent form. Um, then they're given uh, our numbers, basically, the responsible researchers there. The other thing is that we secure anonymity. No one knows. I don't even know who are interviewed. Because anonymity means that I, as a, I, because I'm far removed from them. No? The only one who knows their address, their identity, their contact numbers would be the interviewer. Right? Uh, I would not know it. And uh, our rule is that we should not in any way get any information as to who those, the specific details 
the names, the telephone numbers, and addresses of the ones who are interviewed. Uh, we secure anonymity and we secure confidentiality. So uh, eventually what we see will be respondent numbers. Um, we don't also release the areas that we went to. No uh -huh. one knows that. No one knows that. Uh, no one knows where we're going to before we conduct the survey. There are very few of us who would know the areas that we sampled. And after the survey, our subscribers will never know exactly what barangay we went to. At most, what they will find out will be the province. Right. So in, in this case, uh, it's one way to see... Well, if, they, if someone really intends to... Um, manipulate the surveys, then they will have to go to all of the municipalities and barangays in the country, which is close to impossible, right? Because we only select, what, uh, 1,200 respondents. At, at most, that means that in each barangay, we only select five. So what you normally do have is a very random selection, and it's quite difficult to say that you know, once we select this barangay, that in this barangay there's that fear factor. We will not exclude that factor. Uh, we will not exclude what other social scientists will call falsifying preferences. Right, right. There will be reasons behind it, uh, but um, it's pretty difficult, no, to really gauge it when the interview is being conducted. Uh, Richard, I, I myself have done those interviews. Right. I've observed some of our interviews. Um, I note how the non the nonverbal behavior of respondents. Uh, but more often than not, our rule also is that no one should be in the room aside from the interviewer and the respondent as much as possible. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask that, you know, Ronnie, like, um, are your folks trained to make sure that in the Sundan, I don't know, or you know, yeah. dodgy people again. I understand because Pulse Asia was established when you know you, you had a more or less semi-functioning democracy, right? But of course, some realities change, unfortunately, over the past few years. So I'm just trying to play the devil's advocate here. Kung people have the proper training to make sure that first, pag you walk in and ask, uh, hello, po, I mean, you, first of all, you're not scared or intimidating. And second, you're not being followed by some dodgy person, which may give you know, weird ideas to the person that so, so first, you, you clarified now, no one is forced to fill it up. It's, and second, it's anonymous. Third, no one is being paid to do it. So I am di wag kung natakot ka. But again, for the sake of uh, transparency, I just wanted to make sure. Parang ginawa kong confidential fund ano to. No, but but we really have to. Because Ronald, you know, you know, frustration. Nga, like you're always asked on media to give your analysis, but I think uh, there there's not enough questioning about what goes the the processes yeah. that go into what you're doing para lang ma-appreciate ng tao kasi kung na-mystify yan doon nagkakaroon ng kung ano anong marites diba so I'm just trying to push back against the marites and also uh, you know explain to people what are the things being done by legitimate of course they're fake survey agents we'll talk about those things later on but for legitimate institutions how do you safeguard against those 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 things well, una we, you don't seek permission from the barangay uh, there are occasions quite rare where our interviewers are essentially asked to go to the barangay hall. In those cases, we ask them to contact us, and we we, we feel that it's really not it will affect the integrity of the survey. We just randomly select a new barangay. Rare occasions, Richard. Uh, when I say rare, that means it would not necessarily happen in our national surveys. It more or less happens in our local surveys, the ones that are commissioned. Exactly. Closer to elections, you know, when people really are quite uh, uh, sensitive to people who are moving around and the candidates, the contenders themselves are the ones that are monitoring who are the outsiders. In those cases, we, we given the expertise of our field interviewers, there are ways by which we basically look at the um, maneuvers no? in order to avoid. But in our regular surveys, we have rarely had an, an experience wherein you have someone who is really intimidating our interviewers. You have someone who is trailing our interviewers. Um, this is for the national surveys. Because it's not dispersed. Ang barangay kasi, ang local survey, medyo, if you have a 600 respondents, if the locality is small, it, it, it's more concentrated, right? Uh, uh, 
um, but not and even in those local surveys, it's not so frequent that we uh, it's quite rare that we experience yung people who are being monitored or accompanied by officials. When that happens, we ask our interviewers to immediately tell us, the field supervisors, just simply select a new sample spot or barangay. Yeah, I mean, or, um, so there's a protocol na, yeah, I mean, if something dodgy, suspend it or discard na lang yeah. the sample, no? Yeah, kasi yeah. you're right, it's so hard to coordinate on the national level. Bantayin nyo kung sino mga pulsation dyan pag nandun sila. You know, like, the level of the nation, that's quite hard. But if this yeah. is like a small fight among 12 barangays, as random as you're gonna be, you can, you know, you can better coordinate ways to intimidate it. But what we're saying is that there's still protocols uh, to mm. deal with the situation. Do you also rely on like locals to do the surveys for you? Like, uh, or or it's it's like people from Manila are parachuted into different areas. How does it happen? No, no, no. In the um, people who do the surveys in the provinces are in those provinces because the the survey would be administered using the vernacular. So that means uh, that uh, right, right. Um, these are people who, for example, if you do a survey, part if the sample is in somewhere in the northern Luzon areas, then those are people who should be able to Lohan. take it. Because you give the option to the respondent what questionnaire they will use, whether they will use the Filipino, which is the controlling language that we have, the Tagalog, or English, or the local language. And in this case, it is best for us to continually tap the interviewers who already are in that area. Those are interviewers that we train before we send them out to the field. So in each of our surveys, there's always a field interviewer training. Even if the question, many of the questions are repeated in our surveys, we still conduct the training uh, and we attend those training. More often than not, now the training is via Zoom. And then those trainings are replicated uh, in every area. So we have trainings for people who do the survey in Luston and the Visayas and Mindanao. Um, so they're not shipped out. No, they're not coming all from commando operation in the no? Yeah. Uh, and and do, do, they, do they have like ID, Ronald? Like, I mean, like they, 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 they have identification the cards. Yeah. yeah. My identification cards normally they, their identification cards are with our data collection partners um when they introduce themselves they introduce themselves as part of the data collection team but conducting a survey for pulse asia so we we do that i mean the last time i did a pilot for our survey i went to sambanga and the interviewers that i had were all from sambanga and we were doing a survey on uh, countering violent extremism um, so we 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 don't uh, because you know who can speak Chabacano coming from Manila I do not even yeah. understand or, yeah. or, or yeah. Visaya uh, so you need someone from those areas uh, and, and the variation variations like we don't speak Ilocana the same way in Baguio than say I don't know in, in Batac right or Santa Maria right so so you really need people on the ground now uh, how do you make sure that when they translate it into vernacular, these are not leading questions? So essentially, I'm asking the question, how do you make sure that the questions are not leading questions, cons including when they are translated into vernacular by your people on the ground? Yeah, so there's back translation always. There's translation from the Filipino to the vernacular, and then you translate it back to Filipino. There's always that back translation. Since many of our questions have been really use from one survey to another. Uh, so the bulk of the questions have really been proven in terms of reliability and validity, in terms of translation. But when we have new questions, we do back translations. One more question on this. Sorry, I'm asking all of this background because I think really we have to understand how, it, yeah. like, do you also do like, I don't know, parang rotations or is there is there like a every few years checking whether you guys on the ground are still okay? They're you know you know what I'm saying like how do you make sure that you sustain credible uh you know uh, uh serving on the ground by your people? Well, there there are well in terms of interviewers, we do have a pool of interviewers in our with our data collection partners. We have data collection partners that we work with for quite some time. Uh 
so we trust them um and we 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 ourselves our own staff in pulse asia accompany them so in, in that case our own staff become some sort of observers and supervisors they are able to report back to us what transpired during the interviews and in those observations they basically validate what we feel is the competency of uh, our data collection partner so we've had no problems with them uh, um, and normally that's the same thing that you'll find with regard to market research groups they they tap the same people um, um, and the, these people are people who are quite professional in doing their work um, you don't really have to rotate them you don't really have to replace them uh, they look forward to the work and they're, they're quite uh, really used to doing this service. Many of our interviewers are women uh, because I think in, in our culture, uh, well, it's less intimidating, less intimidating when a woman, you know, knocks on the door and asks and uh, introduces herself as a enumerator. Um, we do have a number of male enumerators, but most of them are women. And 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 Ronnie, um, have you noticed? Like, I mean, do you know? Did you notice that like people are actually excited to share? Their, like, they feel empowered. I mean, ako napansin ko in the little you know student level I did na parang natutuwa sila na you care about their opinion. You know, even if nairapan sila or they have to take away time, even if they're not paid for it, they they feel a sense of empowerment, like they're being heard, right? Yeah, and, and that's always the case. Um, what we do see is the enthusiasm. Uh, we try to avoid lengthening the survey to the extent that there's already fatigue on the part of the respondent. Um, but they're willing to share. They're they're all open. I mean, um, and the other thing that we do in the instrument itself, we try and tend to shuffle the sequence of the question so that. Um, uh, some because if you just keep the same uh, sequence, some questions at the end might necessarily might not necessarily be answered as energetically. So we shuffle it just to make sure that the responses would be more or less even in terms of attention given by the respondents. So um, we have not encountered, um, at least in my case, I have not observed an interview where the respondent has become agitated. Uh, there, Some of them are agitated in a positive way, very passionately. You know, excited. Sila. Expressing uh, their view, even extending beyond just answering the question, providing an explanation. <laughs> but, but, but that's, that's something that you would expect. No? Uh, because in the first place, you're talking to people who already agreed to be interviewed. Uh, so you should expect them that they would go into certain statements that might go beyond what you're actually asking. So that pasensyo so katalaga. Now, Ronnie, I think nagwarm up na tayo. Now let's go for it. Mag hard talk pa tayo. First question I want to ask it is a hard talk part, <laughs> like part uh, this, the the latter part of our interview. Sorry, kung pinahaba ko because I I just wanted to demystify a lot of misunderstanding about this. First of all, what do you think about digital surveys? And and because I mean I've I've observed many digital surveys and they give wildly different uh outcomes. Is it because some are dodgy and some are not, or is it because inherently digital surveys cannot have the accuracy that uh you know your more quote unquote analog version of surveys uh you know, possess? Well, there well by dig if you if but what you mean by digital is something that is done online the mobile or yeah internet yeah. I don't know, or whatever uh, then there would be limitations um the more common digital survey done right now especially in market research is what is referred to as the panel the one where you draw a representative serve uh do a representative survey from a panel of respondents many companies have the have, gathered so better respondents no? and they have a panel of about 300,000 in their pool and you select the some from those 300 from that 300,000 so that's one type of survey sampling that is done right now the problem with that one is that in some panels that's actually an opt-in panel that means that you're actually you're asked whether you wish to participate 
uh, it's incentivized even. Um, uh, and we find out, for example, in many countries, including the Philippines, that there's a tendency for this to be the participants there in that panel to be more urban based, to be much more highly educated, belonging to a younger group, right? So my bias ka agad yung data mo kasi it's a slice of the pizza, not the complete. Yeah. So there is a limitation. The other thing that you, you we should remember is that we still have a digital divide, although it's not as huge as it was, let's say, a year ago. No, In our own surveys, we find out that about three out of four Filipinos have access to the internet now, largely to their smartphone. So, But that rules out 25% still. Now, We've tried doing our own digital surveys, but the problem with the digital survey using the mobile phone, Richard, is that you don't have a sampling frame. You don't know who's using that mobile phone. There's no yeah, exactly. mobile phone directory, right? We tried reaching out to mobile phone providers, the service providers, to ask them just basic questions. How many subscribers are there in regions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9? What are the age distributions? They cannot provide us that because it's also proprietary information. Yun nga eh. Yun nga, I was thinking about the yeah, yeah. So it's not so it's not going to be difficult to do a a sampling frame when you don't have those data, right? Uh, and and that's the reason why we cannot do the um, uh, random selection of uh, well, random generation of mobile phone numbers. Um, so I was telling one group, for example, some a family has five mobile phones, but one mobile phone uh, holder might be a 16-year-old um, guy, no, who we're not supposed to be interviewing. Uh, so the quality is always too difficult. Yeah, so there are limitations to that one. Um, and then you had this type of service digital where you go online and then people just opt in. Uh, that's the least probabilistic because again, that's convenient. No? Basically, self-selection bias. Eh? The ones who wish to participate will participate. Mga people lang nasa sample, but they're not necessarily a representative of the, the broader voting population. As I said, malay mo yung 12-year-old na Bibo is voting for four different person or whatever, right? Uh, all through the... Now, Nevertheless, I noticed in the last elections, hindi masyadong malayo marami mga digital surveys dun sa mga sinasabi ng Pulse Asia. Is that a coincidence or is, is that, like, how do you explain that? I mean, there were dodgy surveys. I'm not gonna name names. Like, sobrang layo. Pero a lot of them were not too far from what we saw with, with, with Pulse Asia. Or yeah, might might be a coincidence. Might might be a function of whatever statistical balancing or treatment they did. But I would say that, you know, it would be hard to see whether it, that one can be rep replicated. No? Uh, because um, um, it, it really depends on what their methods are. Unfortunately, Richard, I don't know what the methods, the sampling methodology of those surveys were. Maybe I should interview them also on that. No? But you guys in Pulse Asia are not thinking of doing a kind of a digital uh, supplementary we, uh, we are but it's it's basically what we do is what other survey organizations do we ask our respondents of prior survey in prior surveys whether they're willing to be interviewed either face to face or online subsequently but you have to build that huge database uh, we we learned that we did that after the during the pandemic, because during the pandemic it was really pretty hard for us to do a face to face interview. We actually missed two rounds of our quarterly survey because of the pandemic. Uh, so, but again, the gold standard is still face to face interviews worldwide. It's not done in other country because it's expensive, but it remains the gold standard in in doing surveys. Now let me. I think that's that's. It perfectly for my next question. Now you already said your thing on the so your argument is that with the, with the problem with the digital kind of mobile base is that you already have a, a selection bias there because you're reaching out to people you don't even know their age who have access to cell phones and all. Now we saw the explosion of the so-called Google trends <laughs> in the last elections and 
similar arguments were made against it, right? Including by yours truly. I mean, obviously, you're looking at people of access to internet, reliable internet uh, throughout time and throughout space. And then the other thing is Google Trends just looks at whether you're interested in a certain topic. So I may be interested in, I don't looking at what's happening with person X, but because maybe I hate that person, that's why I'm checking that person, right? Not necessarily because I want to vote for that person. What is your take on the whole Google Trends discourse? And and as someone who does legitimate surveys, how do you feel about that? I, I know this is where the contentious part comes in, but I think we really have to honestly talk about it, yeah. Yeah, in I, I read some articles in scholarly journals that... that um, basically look at not only Google Trends, but also Facebook postings, social media postings yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, as means of predicting uh, voting behavior. But what they do is that it's not just on a specific time frame, not just during the election period. They look back across time. They look at postings, let's say, several years back. They look at the consistency in order to determine the political inclination of a particular individual uh, who tends to be, uh, well, in a sense, it's a complete digital footprint. Uh, and it's not just using a search at a particular point or period of time in Google. So it's a long, it's a study in oh. itself that's longitudinal. Um and I don't think that we have that capacity that we did, that people who said that Google Trends can be predictive in the Philippines did that work. They basically they just work with the data that you can find in Google Trends, like uh, what is the rate of searching for a particular candidate, which we found was also not that significant in terms of frequency. Yeah, because you're, you're looking at just what, less than 100,000 searches for a particular period. And, and so, not necessarily the representative, right? Because these are people on Google, you need proper yeah, not, the, not representative. And that's not in, in any way indicate really the political leanings of those who are searching. So if you wish to do that, then you have to do a much more thorough sentiment analysis working with all the platforms. So, um, but that's much more difficult now, no? given all of the privacy settings that have been set up. Especially with uh, Apple, also, right? Uh, if you're using Apple, because it may must restrictive in terms of not being trapped, etc. So yeah. there, there's so what you're saying is that in theory, metadata or big data analysis could be helpful, but Google Trends, as it was deployed in the last elections, was just a surface level, very you know, essentially slice of that kind of approach, no, uh, or methodology. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're saying you, metadata could work, but Google Trends was not exactly a full consummation of that uh, methodology. Yeah, and you, you need to do some sampling also for that metadata to be really truly representative also. And that's another thing. No? Uh, I'm not someone who is capable of doing that, but I think those who are in big data would really need to define how because, you know, the problem was that many of the so-called data analytic people who predicted that, you know, it would be a close contest were really quite off no, in terms of prediction uh, in the last. They said that in France it worked and then in other countries it worked. But in the Philippines, it definitely was far from what we saw. Uh, and they should believe all of the uh, allegations that the elections was, there was massive fraud. That happened in the 2022 elections. Yeah, I mean, uh, which I think brings me to the next question. I mean, the 2008, the bus, since you have been, you know, at the helm of the the Pulse Asia, did you imagine that we'll come to to to, to a time whereby you'll you'll uh, you know you'll be so much at the receiving end of so many attacks, uh, you know, questioning your integrity, your institutions, or a lot of uh, some would say, un un of course, unfair attacks against. This kind of surveys, people who don't even understand how scientific surveys. I mean, so, so this is more of a personal question, Ronnie. I mean, you know, Ronnie, I you know, I have my own share of being trolled, so I understand how stressful it can get. Uh, but I want to hear it from you. How how difficult what is because the reason I say this, Ronnie, is because I know you and, and many of us, your colleagues, know you as someone who has fought for democracy uh throughout decades. We know you're someone who cares about democracy, who fought for uh for the progress of civil liberties and political rights in this country. So 
I can imagine. I mean, kung ikaw isang corporate person, you're really in it for money. May annoy ka lang. But if 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 you're a person who are doing service and at the same time you have this long, uh, you know, lifelong commitment to democratization and and freedom in the country, like I I, I, I suppose it's doubly painful, right? I mean, how 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 did you feel about all of those attacks against Pulse Asia in particular? Because you're the most prominent survey agency. I mean, presidents respond. When there's a Pulse Asia survey, they don't necessarily respond to other surveys. No offense to them, but when Pulse Asia comes out, people respond, right? Big people respond. So you guys really matter. But unfortunately, with mattering also comes a lot of attacks, including from mm. people that we expected more from. To be honest about it, well, yeah. Um, actually, the more the one that has much more of an impact in terms of your own mental health would be um, the ones who you think know you better and yes yet do not in any way um trust the or even question you know, your trustworthiness in this case um and it's become a bit more toxic you no know, specifically as the elections progress it was not it was the same also in 2010 we were being accused of being the one in 2016 we were being accused by the the ones of being by advance uh, in 2022, we were also being accused of being by Alliance. Now that we, I don't know what the accusation is right now, but as you said, but you know, Richard, the thing is that regardless of what we find out, and in many occasions, I've told close friends, I tend to disagree with the findings, but we don't have any choice but to release the findings, so whether we agree or disagree with it, whether. We think that this is the appropriate voting behavior, opinion on the issue. Um, it's just that we stand pat on the integrity of the process. We believe that this is a systematically done survey. And as an academic organization, we are bound to disseminate the results and face the criticism from peers. No? If there are flaws in the methodology, there is a flaw in the question, then we will work towards refining those methods and those questions. But if the attack is on our personal integrity, then that definitely, I think, is un, uh, basically below the belt. Yeah, it, there was a lot of below the belt, including by some of us who tried to question, you know, uh, the questioning of your integrity. Uh, we noticed how toxic things could get uh, over there as well. At least you're saying that that was not the first time you, 2010, palang, uh, na feel niyan. But, but I think last election was pretty difficult because it came from a side that perhaps you would have expected to have more sympathy for academics, independent-minded people, and Democrats for that matter, no? uh, like you know. Um, how did you cope with it At the, on a human level? Like, uh, I'm sure it was, I mean, like what? You started cooking, doing vlogs. Like, oh, the, my whole vlogging was my therapy, right? It's like, oh, well, I'll, talk, you know, well, I'll do vlogs, right? Let's go for it. That's my, this is my therapy. What, what's yours, um, Ron? No, cooking has always been a therapy for me even when I was in school administration. Uh, so it's one way to take my attention away from all the problems that I did not in any way create. Uh, so I did more cooking, but there were occasions where I could not anymore cook because I was definitely affected by all of the criticism, especially from people that were supposed to know me better. I, I don't care about those who I don't know. Uh, and you do get that. Uh, I avoided social media uh, as much as possible. I will not in any way look at Twitter. I will not look at Facebook. <laughs> My Facebook does not even have anything political. I mean, yeah, occasionally, I occasionally, occasionally I do when I feel very strongly about an issue, especially when it involves human rights. Uh, but if, if it's just a question of um, let's say, you know, an action taken by a politician, I would not even comment. Yeah, uh, because people might say, "Oh, you're biased against this person or that yeah, person." Know, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, so... uh, Ronald, uh, Ronald. I mean, it, uh, to be uh, half joking about it, like if 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 I didn't know you and I check your, I uh, know your your feed surface, I would say, "Pedian mag Michelin star," I know, <laughs> like you could be that guy, right? Because it may just yeah. hard in doubt. They come in anonymously. You don't know. They are just food critics, you know. Their job is not too different from yours. Like You're like the Michelin star of Philippine politics, right? Um, Now, uh, 
let's go to the last part of our discussion. Really, really last part. I know it's too magal ito, but uh, Ronnie, it's the first time natin mag-usap na mabuti in in you know in, in in a public sense. So sorry if I I I I you know I had to really go deep, but I'm not sorry. I think this is very important. Now, let's put your up. Let's put on your political scientist hat, right? What is your reading of surveys longitudinally throughout the past 10, 15 years? Before we go to individuals, let's talk about issues. Is corruption as important to the Filipino voters as it was back in the day? Because my understanding is based on Paul Asia, you know, let's say 2009, 2008 to 2010. Mohang, the concerns with corruption perhaps was, was more close to people compared to today? Or like, what does that say about importance of good governance for voters well, it, compared it, to economic it, issues? Yeah. It was a more prominent issue in the latter part of the Aloy administration, and it became even more prominent uh, in the first part of the Aquino administration, largely because then Noyne Aquino basically signaled that this is an issue that they would address. Um, as I mentioned in the past in some other interviews, you do have that presidential signaling effect. So when the president impresses upon the public that this is an important issue, People tend to regard it as an important issue. We saw this in Duterte also, when he said uh, illegal drugs is a urgent concern. Suddenly, you had a spike in terms of people saying he did it as a presidential I, candidate, right? I remember before him becoming president, biglang out of nowhere, nagiging important at on crime and uh, fighting criminality is an yeah, important issue. As a candidate, palang, de ba? He was able to do that. That's how powerful it yeah. was. But corruption has always been in the top five. Among governance issues, it is the issue that has remained, at least in the top five, the ones that people feel that the government should immediately address. Um, it has not stayed in the top three. The top three that we've seen over the past years, since 1999, Based basically yeah. material yeah. got issues, you know, high prices, pay, poverty, jobs. Uh, so they basically switch position, but inflation has always been number one. Uh, so it, does it mean that people do not give that much importance to good governance? I don't really think so. I think to a certain extent, because we've seen this in local surveys that we do, um, I think people still think that it's important for government to function, but they that's ex that expectation might be really more at the level of the local government. Uh, at the national government, there might be other expectations and it really depends on what is given more emphasis by the national administration or the, the president for that matter. So we see, like, for instance, the issue of uh, law and order, right? Not as important if you look at the service right now when in fact... Not long ago, we thought that's the end-all, be-all issue. That's the most important thing, and hence perhaps the popularity of former president, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. presidential signaling, as you say, is important in, in case. Now, um, speaking of foreign policy, for instance, one of the things I... Sorry for being a little bit selfish here because this is kind of my area. We always hear that if you look at the uh, the list of most urgent issues, it's a bit foreign policy as, as a kind of an urgent issue. Nevertheless, also, it looks like whenever something big happens in West Philippine Sea, nabuli yung mga inista na, there's an explosion of, of public response and, and suddenly presidents have to care about because because Paul Seixas has done a lot of surveys that shows like what, 8 out of 10 Filipinos want us to take tougher stance in the South China Sea. Many things that Duterte, as a popular president, was going against. I mean, how, how, how do you explain that? Is it like a cyclically important issue, not consistently urgent, but cyclically important that could still impact? Uh, policy? Yeah. Well, it's important, but relative to the other concerns, it's not as urgent. So when you ask people separately what do they think about the West Philippine Sea and our territorial claims, they will tend to say that it's something that we should fight for. But you, when you arrange it against other issues, it's not as urgent, right? So people do see the importance of, let's say, protecting our ensuring our territorial integrity. Um, and they, they, for example, under this administration, and even in the previous administration, perplexingly, the administration was getting high at, at approval ratings in defending our territorial integrity. In Mindanao, I saw the SWA surveys. In Mindanao, you had very high 
Yeah, so that's that's a it's as I said, it's perplexing despite the fact that in the previous administration, uh, it was only late in the administration when basically the president continually invoke the uh, ruling that basically bestowed legitimacy on our claims. So, um, but people feel that it's important, but not as urgent as let's say the gut issues. Uh, Therefore, and, they have some room for maneuver, maybe to President Duterte, and and the way his foreign policy was interpreted on the ground, perhaps is different from what many outside saw, no, or his critics see. Yeah. So I'm just trying to explain the, the seeming paradox there, you know. Um, now let's talk about the latest survey because President Marcos Jr. I mean, 65 percent approval rating. That's that's like a golden number in a U.S. democracy or European democracy. Like I mean, Biden would have. I mean, is Biden's biggest dream would be to have a 60, 70 percent approval rating. Nevertheless, it's much lower than all the, you know, I, mean, I think Aquino was around 77 percent at this point in time in some of the surveys. Duterte was around 80 percent. Uh, are people exaggerating that, oh, he, like BBM has to be troubled or the drop by 15 points is really something special, including, I think, 29 percent drop among Class E and 21 or 22 percent among ABC. So, it held among class D who are the biggest proportion, right? We can debate about the reasons behind, but but it looks pretty significant in at least two out of three demographics, albeit the smaller ones. How important, yeah. I mean, how big was that? If you're BBM, should you be worried? I mean, you still have 65% approval. Yeah, I, I guess any president should be worried about this one, although 65, and I, I do agree. Other leaders, can, leaders in other countries would be happy with it. But when you suffer a 15-point drop, that's quite significant, uh, especially since, you know, uh, I think we, we're coming from a situation that people are not necessarily unfamiliar with. Um, inflation has continually increased over the past year. Uh, maybe people tempered their expectations over the past year, but suddenly, you know, given that there's no end to it, we'll withdraw with withdraw the approval, but they shifted more to indecision, Richard, rather than disapproving. So that means they're still essentially on a wait and see uh, attitude. Now, whether this will continue to decline is something that we cannot predict. Now, we'll see it in the next quarterly survey. Uh, but it's the highest decline we've seen uh, for the same period of time uh, compared to previous presidents, because as you said, Aquino was 72, the 30 was 80. Right. They started off at 79 and 86, respectively. Uh, so the decline was not significant if you compare it from where they started off. Marco started right. at 84. It's down to 65. So that's a 19-point drop uh, in this case. And any president should be worried. And I think he's acting as such, you know, speaking yeah. as a political scientist, because uh, exactly. he's been going around distributing lies, uh, he took out the rice seal, the rice ceiling on rice, believing that the harvest would be sufficient to stabilize the price of rice, at least in the next quarter. And I think they'll take every measure necessary, like Duterte did in September 2018, when the yeah, same the issue came up. I, I, uh, the rice price or rice, rice, rice prices. Rice also, uh, it, his approval went down. By double digit, then I think yeah, it was but about, 15, about 11 yata or something like that. 13, 13, 13 points, 13. but still quite significant. But 75 pa rin yun eh, natatanda ko, Richard. It's still high, but you know, you scamper. Uh, every time that you know people will hold uh, or withdraw approval, um, people are quite sensitive to it, although they say they, they're not necessarily sensitive to it. I think political leaders are quite sensitive to it. Because unless they arrest that decline, they will be facing more challenges. And in this current environment where you see also some sort of intramurals among our political leaders, the last thing that you would want to happen is that your political capital uh, is reduced as evidenced by lower approval or trust ratings. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right. Actually, I, I remember like uh, Duterte had twice at least, not double. One was with the Kian de los Santos. The other one was this uh, when the whole rice issue and rice tarification law came in. But nevertheless, there was a Teflon effect, right? I, I mean, I hate to use that term, but just just so that it's relatable to people. Like 
he showed tremendous amount of resilience in terms of keeping his numbers in the 70, 80, at some point in the 90 territory. But yeah. that's not the case now, right? With the corn. I mean, I would even say even Aquino had the semi Teflon effect, right? He still went out with majority approval despite all the, you know, he bungled the whole Mama Sapano, the whole, you know, Lag Lag Bala. So is Marcos Jr. showing less resilience? Is the honeymoon over? I mean, what's the proper way of framing it? Or just to say it's too early to say. It's just a short-term signaling or flash in the pan. What is your hunch here? As a political scientist, not the Pulse Asia guy. Yeah, well, current conditions make it a little bit more difficult for him to sustain the level of approval that he had in the past. For one, the economy has really been challenged, you know, given all of the external uh, developments. Stocks but the other, yeah, but the other thing that is really that he is confronting right now is, as, as I said, you know, the internal uh, uh, differences, or would, I mean, avoiding it to become a turmoil among members of uh, or factions of his unit team. Uh, we see it now. No, we. It's too early for this type of politicking to happen, you know. But but the election, uh, midterm elections is near, right? I mean, the yeah, elections but, but, are going to happen but, now. But, but still too early. We we people always compare it. Let's say, for example, this, uh, the time of Noin Neumann, uh, the vice president then George Abinay, of course, was known to have political ambitions, but I don't think that Abinay made that there was any significant. Uh, in was this attack on then Vice President Bina until late in that administration? Uh, the midterm was a midterm that was party less, also. You had Tim Pinoy and the United, United Nationalist Alliance. Uh, it might turn out to be the same now, it's going to be party less, it's basically the coalition. But the conflict within the administration started, I mean, that. The problems within the administration started quite early for an administration that came into power with majority voting support. Yeah. I, I, you're you know, first referring to the Romualdez Arroyo than then the whole time. Uh, even so, even so. the designation of the executive secretary, the displace, the placement of some of the secretaries, Perfect. and then the conflict, the supposed conflict between the House Speaker, the renewed conflict between the House Speaker and the Vice President, allegedly because of uh, the decision of the former to slip the latter of the confidential intelligence funds. See, this is the part of you I I, I think people should hear more. Your political analyst side because you're always the false Asia side. Parang Superman eh, na ano ka eh, para tigan na uh, you're just stuck. So I I just wanted people to hear that you know in terms of your analysis. Now let the last one. Let's talk about Sara Duterte, right? I mean, first of all, my sense is perhaps if the survey was in the second half of September or, I mean, I, I know your, your cycles, but I'm just saying, I, my sense is if it were in the second half of September, perhaps her, her numbers would have probably dropped even more. And, and my, my hypothesis is because if you look at the whole confidential issue controversy, I mean, I'm not saying anything because, you know, uh, you know, uh, She's presumed innocent, but but concerns with good governance, I think, really culminated towards the end of September. So I won't be surprised if her numbers would have dropped more if this uh, the survey was in the second half rather than the first half or mid middle of September. But nevertheless, it's also a curious thing that she had eleven points drop. I mean, she's not the president, she's not the Department of Agriculture secretary. Both of those are Marcus Jr., of course, right? Um, and yet she's still seeing that drop, right? And I would have expected her to be actually more resilient because the but there's supposed to be solid South Vizmin vote. And we saw some drop even in Mindanao numbers, something like 95 to 87, 86, something like that. Um, what's yeah. going on with the Sara situation? What is your political analysis there? It's it's really a drop in two different areas in the national capital region and the Bals of Luzon, which I think where I think the public basically is withholding support from the Empire. national yeah. in general. The decline he, she suffered in the Visayas and Mindanao are still within the margin of error from survey to survey. So it's a it's a marginal decline, although it's a drop from, of nine points, I think, in Mindanao. But it's not so significant relative to the decline across all areas of the president. And you're correct. But if the survey was done towards the latter part of the month, where there was really much more news about, let's say, the uh, transfer of funds to her funds. in 2022 and how she spent those funds in 11 days, 
uh, the questions being raised by people from various political fronts, um, maybe it would have an impact separately from the impact of, let's say, inflation on the performance rating of top officials. Or maybe BBM's number would have been slightly better because, you know, as important as the... Because he also had big drops at ABC, right? 21, yeah. 22%, right? And my sense is... Um, 22. 22, right? 22. So my sense is probably BBM would have done slightly better. Maybe the numbers would have closed at 13%. I mean, it's very speculative, but I'm looking at news cycles and, you know, the the emotionality of the moment and, and you know, public discontent. I think confidential issue was far bigger issue towards the end, though, especially for... But uh, you know, but remember, if, opponent, if opponents of BBM were to raise that same issue, I can raise actually the same issue to him because the transfer came from the office of the president. And the transfer is, from the words of one of the minority leaders, illegal and even unconstitutional. It's almost similar to what I suppose. We, yeah, yeah. The, the assertions before about the disbursement acceleration program under Noyner Aquino, right? And Bursa the Supreme Court, yeah. You, back cannot, there. you cannot transfer to items that are not existent in the budgets of other agencies. And in this case, the, um, the claim is that there was no budget for CIF under the former vice president. So therefore, how can you transfer funds to the budget of the incumbent vice president? So the, the president could be held accountable also. Their way. If 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 the if the, her his opponents would raise it, uh, fortunately for them, it was not as uh, deliberated yet when we did the survey. Let's see uh, whether this will still be salient as a political issue come the fourth quarter survey. Ronald, thank you so much, uh, Ronnie. Thank you so much for for this very comprehensive interview. I really juiced you out both as the false Asia chief and at the same time as a. Uh, fellow political scientist and longtime colleague. Marami salamat, Ronnie. Thank you. I hope I can disturb okay. you in the next quarters. I know you're super in demand, but I think people want really in-depth analysis in the like, you know, two to three minutes, quotable quotes. Uh, I hope people, you know, will look forward to all sorry discussions. I really appreciate I appreciate your analysis, Ronnie. And uh, Mabuhay ka, more power to you. Okay. Is there anything you want to say? I mean, say? Is there any parting words or something? I like? don't know. No. <laughs> keep, keep well, <laughs> Richard. Okay, mabayit ka, Ronnie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day. God bless.